So our digital hub platform, uh, it's going to be available to you um, to be accessed on cloud.digitalhub.io. Currently, you're going to see that on this platform, you can quickly sign in into it. Um, you're also going to be able to sign uh, register for our platform with uh, the sign up link here. So I'm just going to log in. Uh, what, this is what you will see when you log into Digital Hub. Uh, we're going to show you how you can very quickly create a project. So the whole premise of the Digital Hub when we build it is so that like, we can quickly um, generate different projects. The project is going to have security in mind. They're going to have data isolation, data segregation in mind um, for you so that you can very easily manage your projects. And also, because today we're going to be showing a machine learning, I'm going to show you um, creating a machine learning project. So in here, I choose uh, my type of project to be machine learning. We have already suggested some components that you can uh, deploy onto your project uh, for a quick, uh, in order to start machine learning very quickly. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to choose all three of my components. I'm going to add some members. So I'm going to add Holda. I'm going to add her as the owner of this project. And I'm going to add that. Back. I'm going to give my project a good name. And a nice description. Maybe give it a few takes that I can quickly easily search for it later. And just simply click create. So once you've created the project, um, this is where we're going to start to launch up your all of these um, different applications for you in the cloud. Uh, so on the cloud here, what you will actually be able to see is that because the supersets, the Grafana, and the H2O components here, they're all segregated. So, so for every single one of your project, it's going to be a different uh, application from each other. Even though you might have the same components in different projects, but they're going to be actually two different deployments uh, on the cluster. So that's how you can keep all of your work segregated and reduce the chance of uh, having data contamination or even security risk. But for the um, purpose of time, uh, we already have a project created to show you. So in this case, I have all of my components here. If I do not need these components, I can just quickly pause it. That's how you can uh, manage your time um, on, uh, for your project. So that, that's also a way that you can reduce cost. Because um, as Bob Beck said, what's going to cost you is actually the time that your application is going to be running. So in this case, I'm also going to launch my Jupyter. So Jupyter Lab is going to launch up for us. And then in here, what we're, you're actually going to see uh, once it finishes is that in my home directory, I have a project folder. So inside the project folder, you're going to be able to see um, all of your projects that has finished launching, so all of the project folders. And what these are is actually shared folders between you and all of your team members. So then that's uh, just a way to uh, achieve some more efficient collaborations. Uh, sometimes we do this, uh, the risk uh, of you just needing to upload and download um, folders, especially in this time of COVID, where we pretty much have all of our files shared online. Um, and then so in here, I also have already have my notebook uh, that's going to do the machine learning. Uh, and when you register for uh, Digital Hub and create, start creating projects, you can also uh, get access to this notebook uh, by going to the templates folder here. So then once you click on the templates icon, choose Digital Hub, and then choose the last one here, AutoML Power Plant uh, Energy. So this notebook here is going to be the same notebook that I'm going to be demoing to you today. We also have a lot of other different templates that is going to help you um, get into so a lot of the common data science processes, so um, exploratory analysis and also time series, um, rock type classifications, um, et cetera, for you to just streamline your workflow. In this case, I'm going to open up here. I'm just going to start and run the entire notebook because it does take some time um, for the machine learning models to fit. 
So as Babak has said, um, the premise of this problem is that we have a combined cycle power plant. Um, and then so we have data for over six years uh, when this power plant is active. Uh, and we also for these data, what we have is the ambient temperature, the pressure, humidity, and the exhaust vacuum pressure. And then so we think that these are four very important features into uh, predicting what is the output, uh, the energy output of the plant. So in this case here, uh, so that's what we're going to be start looking at. Um, this whole data set is about 9,000 data points. Um, so then we're going to be using it to generate uh, a machine learning model. So what you're going to see here is um, PANDAS profiling. So if you have been following our webinar series, you will be able to know that uh, the PANDAS profiling, you will be familiar with it. So this is a very efficient uh, Python library that actually allow us to do very quickly um, some exploratory data analysis on our data set. So with just simply two lines of code, um, you will be able to, what it generates for you is actually a very quick statistics of an overview of your data set. Um, it highlights to you if there's any missing problems, if there's any difficult rules in your data set that might suggest to you um, that you need to do some cleanup. And additionally, it helps you do some of the feature analysis, giving you, generating very quickly a distribution for you. This is where we can um, identify if the problems where we have maybe skill distributions or we have um, non-linearity, um, outliers. Um, so just looking through these um, features here. Um, for more information, you can refer to uh, the video of our previous webinar where we go through um, the function of this uh, VDA in details. Uh, but just looking through it, we can see that most of our features seems to be very nicely. Uh, there's not really any missing values. There's no outliers. Abnormally nice data set. And of course, we have the date and time. What's interesting one is that it also gives you a quick correlations plot that you can take a look at all, uh, a two-factor uh, relationship between any of your variables. If you want to see everything at a glance, you can also see a correlation heat map. So missing values and then some sample of your data sets. So now we look through our data set, everything seems to be fine. So now we're gonna go ahead with our machine learning. So one very common practice, actually is probably one of the best practice, is that you need to split up your data set. Uh, the common practice is to split them into a training set, a test set, and a validation set. Um, usually about the proportion of um, 80, uh, 60%, 20, 20%, um, this is how I have split up my data. So because this is a time uh, series data, uh, what I want to imitate is that if I train my models on some past data, once it sees future data points coming in, it wouldn't be able to predict correctly. So what I did is that I took out, out the last three months of my data set, I'm saving that up, for my validations. So these are the data sets that I would not touch during my training process. And then I have the rest of the data sets. That's going to be split into the training and testing data set for me to develop my model. So next, we have a um, machine learning package. Uh, so for this, uh, we're using H2O. It's an open source Python package for machine learning. Um, Scikit-learn is also uh, installed on here. Um, so one benefit that you can get from Digital Hub is we've already integrated a lot of these useful packages and libraries for you. So it's just very easily for you accessible at the point of just few lines of code, no need to set up, no need to configurations, um, just to streamline your process. So I see that my H2 is working. Uh, I load my data set for the uh, machine learning algorithm for it. I can see here's my data set. It's, everything is loading it properly. I don't have any uh, wrong data types. And I'm going to identify for it uh, what is the target. Since this is a supervised machine learning problem, uh, we do have the target uh, column, which is going to be that net energy output that we have um, for all of these uh, examples. So then this is for that the machine learning package here, they will be able to know uh, what are they training on and so what they need to get their predictions to be close to. So this is where I have split up now my um, this uh, set of data into my training and my test set. So I have about 6,000 samples in my training and about uh, 1,500 samples for my testing and then now I train it. 
So one very nice uh, feature of the, this machine learning package is that it's actually training for you a lot of different types of machine learning algorithms and a lot of types of machine learning models. Um, and then it chooses for you, um, it just chooses based on like the lowest, uh, the model that gives you the lowest error. Um, and then it returns to you a leaderboard here that you can see what are the models it trained on, um, and how was the performance of this model. And this is going to be arranged uh, in terms of um, the lowest uh, error rate. But just looking through your models here as a data scientist that comes in, um, I look, um, there's some XGBoost models, there's some deep learning neural network model that it has trained on. Knowing my data sets and knowing what I want to take my problems to at the end, I think machine, uh, sorry, um, neural network and deep learning is going to be a lot uh, too much uh, for this problem since we only have, really have four different features. Um, XGBoost is a very common classification and regression model um, in terms of machine learning. It has very good reputations of giving relatively good accuracies and performance. So I would like to go with the XGBoost model. And in this case, of course, I'm going to choose the XGBoost model with the lowest error rate, which also happens to be um, what this machine learning package is telling me is the best uh, model. So now that I've choose my model to look at, I put it through and then I can see a little bit more detail. So this machine learning model, XGBoost, it's really a ensemble model of decision trees. So it's going to be, the decision tree is also a very common regression uh, algorithm uh, for machine learning and just having an ensemble of them, it's going to give me enough complexity to achieve a good accuracy, but at not too complex so that I run into problem like overfitting uh, in terms of machine learning. So I can see a little bit more details on the performance of my models and also on the how it chose this model. So it chose this model through five rounds of cross validations uh, on my training data set and then so giving us uh, these metrics. So just looking through it. What I think is the most interesting is actually what it provides to you here for the variable importance. So then these are going to be the variables that it has identified to be the most relevant to your predictions. So I see that temperature is one and also the exhaust vacuum um, pressure is going to be one. Um, in this case, that's kind of expected uh, for me. But in other cases, if you have other problems we have seen before where um, one of the most important variable that came up was something that like we did not expect at all, and neither did uh, the subject matter experts. So then like, there could be very, some very interesting finding when you look through this and then just chooses out the variables importance. Now, if you actually want to look at the in variable importance for all the other models, um, you can also generate a heat map for you uh, on the correlations here and just this quick, very quickly see temperature actually scores a very high um, correlations in a lot of the models and same with the exhaust vacuum. Uh, so in this case, uh, now that I think this model is good, I've looked through the details, I think this model is going to be very good. I'm going to train it on my test, oh, sorry, predict my test set. And then so this test set is kind of like you're know, giving the model a midterm exam. You're going to like say that these are a bunch of test data points that you have never looked at, predict it, and now I'm going to see how you're performing on it. So looking at my test set, I can see that um, the which means square error. So this is the error rate and also the um, absolute error. It does not seem to be that much different from my training errors. So then in that case, that's suggesting to me that maybe this model, it's not going to have a overfitting problem where we're overfitting to um, just the training data set and not things that it, not generalizing it enough um, for data that they have not seen before. Now, this data set that we have is actually from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. There is a publication on it um, in 2014. Now, that was quite a while ago. Um, the authors, they actually achieved an error rate of um, absolute error of 2.8 and 3.7, which is slightly higher um, than our error rate. So it's been a while. There's a lot of um, data science advancements in these years. So then, like, now we're going to be able to achieve even a better um, error rates of better performance um, on the machine learning model here than what the authors were able to achieve. But looking at it, um, this also add, 
adds on to like another aspect of the digital hub is that like we're always moving on forward with the technology advancement. We're always the digital hub is built with enough flexibility that as soon as new technology comes in, uh, new cutting edge technologies comes in, we will be able to integrate it into the um, entire platform for you. So that we're not limited to what we have now, but also it's going to be a very future proof platform. So going to uh, putting my predictions in with uh, the rest of the features here, um, I can make a quick comparison. I look through it, seems to be all right. So this is also where tra training data sets are very common data science practices that if what I got on the test set here is not what I want, um, a lot of time what we would start doing is to maybe do features engineering or even go into um, having looking into um, problems with the features, um, fine tuning our hyperparameters um, so that we can uh, improve the performance of our machine learning model on the test set. So now because we are using the test sets multiple times as we're trying to improve our model, so this is why the validation set comes in. So let's say, so for today's demo, I'm going to say this model is the best. I don't need to do any more um, tuning. This is going to the model I'm gonna use. So this is where the validation set test comes in. This is like the final exam for your um, model. This is going to be data set that it has never seen before, uh, just to make sure that like it's still generalized enough and you don't are not going to run into overfitting, underfitting, or bias problems. So then, as uh, I've done before, I have uh, merged my uh, imported my validation data set uh, into this machine learning library. I run my predictions. Although just looking through the table, everything seems to be predicting relatively well uh, in terms of like comparing to the actual um, energy output measurement uh, in our data set. But another way that you can also look at it is to look at just the residual part. So this is the um, showing residuals is kind of the difference between uh, your actual and your predictions. I can see most of them, they are um, clustered around zero. There's a few ones that seems to be um, a little bit further apart. This is generally quite normal, uh, actually, uh, for a lot of the machine learning algorithms that you're going to get that, especially because we didn't really do any hyperparameter tuning at this point. Um, so just looking at about three days worth of time, I plotted it over time. Um, Seems like our prediction here, what you see in orange and the blue, uh, that is the actual outputs have a quick comparison. Um, I would say this model is actually performing relatively quite well on this validation data set. And because we've seen uh, from the table before that uh, two of our very important features is actually the temperature and also our exhaust vacuum pressure. Um, just call it very quickly. Uh, that you can also visualize it on here to see how does your energy um, changes with the vacuum and the uh, ambient temperature. So here's the plot. There's also a 2D plot, just a slightly different uh, representation of um, the way the two features uh, affect your uh, energy output. So that was a very quick walkthrough of a machine learning and what you can achieve on our digital hub here. Um, so one thing that like, I really want to emphasize is that like, we've done a lot of work on the digital hub here to ensure that everything is integrated for you and ready to go, uh, such that you will be able to streamline your process, focus on your problem at hand, and not worry about a lot of the setup, a lot of the integrations, and troubles that comes with those two things. Uh, so uh, at the end here, you will see, um, so here's a little bit more information of the original data set. Um, the, uh, the papers um, that the authors um, did on this uh, data set here, they also built a machine learning models that predicts the power and also the H2O uh, AI, which is the open source package we use uh, for machine learning today. So again, this uh, notebook, it will be available for you if you just go into that template section. Um, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, the machine learning demo. Uh, for today, it was very quick demo of a, just in general, what is the machine learning process um, that you will be able to achieve on the digital help here. Um, the whole purpose of us is to try to streamline everything for you. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to um, Babak. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Sylvia. Lots of good questions, great questions. Um, I try to answer as many as I can, uh, but obviously we can't get to all of them without everybody on hold. There's more than 300 people on the line. A few things just to summarize. Um, Sylvia, if you could show where these notebooks are. So there was a number of questions around the notebooks. These notebooks are already part of the package that comes. You can, once you sign up, you can easily get these notebooks. So that's Sylvia is gonna show. And there was another question around people having issues registering today. And that's because there's just too many people um, trying to register all at the same time. And as a startup, we uh, simply just don't have the infrastructure to support all of that at once. Thousands of people are trying to do that, but definitely you can do this. Once we pass that registration stage, uh, you should be able to log in and every project has its own dedicated. There were some questions around security. Every project around data security, every project has its own dedicated database and its own dedicated uh, storage. So uh, if, and every user or every account is separated from other accounts. So unless people are in the same project, there is no way that they can access each, other data, each other's data. There are some questions around where are the data centers. So right now the data centers, we've started the data centers in Canada, but mainly in, in Toronto and Montreal, and we'll be expanding uh, potentially over the time. So that was another question. Uh, another question was around, so what are the differences between AWS, Amazon, and Digital Hub? Digital Hub is a cloud platform, but we're not in the infrastructure business, meaning that we just focus on data science and focus on enabling the data scientists, whereas you know, AWS and you know, Azure, they're really in the cloud, providing the cloud. We are a user of um, Azure and AWS and DigitalOcean and Google, so we are actually their customers in a way because we use their infrastructure. Uh, but we, on top of that, we build the Kubernetes integration, the database integration, and we're giving you level four or five uh, services that are in security integration, use of use, and so on and so forth. That's, that's the difference. And um, there were some other uh, questions around, you know, um, specific for data science. Please uh, reach us in our community. So that's important um, because that's where we would be, that's where we would be uh, answering some of these specific questions. And there are questions around what is the difference between Digital Hub and Alteryx. So Alteryx, for example, is a software. Digital Hub is not a software. Digital Hub is a platform. So think about Amazon for a moment. Amazon, the marketplace Amazon. You can find anything on Amazon, right? Uh, Amazon doesn't make them or produce them, but there are, it is from other vendors that is on Amazon. And Amazon enables the supply chain of it and it enables the payment processing, the shipping. That's what Amazon does. And what what uh, Digital Hub does is enabling the security and integration and other components for open source software, right? So all these open source softwares are on the, um, on the, um, can be on the Digital Hub platform. So we're not a specific, like Alteryx would be a software in itself, but we are a cloud platform. We can host all of these different things and enable them through the integration. One last comment I want to mention to everyone is that if you're having trouble registering today, make sure that you at least register on our website, the digitalhub.io, subscribe to our list. So when we send the uh, link, it will, be, it will be available to you uh, for the free registration. With that, I want to thank everyone uh, who took the time. Um, apologize for going over the time, but we, we tried to answer as many questions as we could. So make sure you join the uh, community, uh, sign up, uh, for our uh, newsletter, so at least we have your email, and then see you again. So don't forget about this because this this use case that you saw has a continuation. See you again on on um, January 26. On January 26, we're going to take this production data and then now look at the market data and see in a real world scenario did it make sense that we produce this much power or should we have throttled down the uh, the power generation? Thank you, everybody.